Hi, I'm, I'm Sam Mandel, uh, COO, uh, Dr. Stephen Mandel, and uh, we're with Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. We'll try to race through a lot of information in a short time. We have zero financial disclosures, except that we operate a ketamine clinic, uh, so we know a little bit about ketamine, doing that for over seven years now. And um, everything we're going to share with you is evidence-based, and uh, we can talk citations afterwards if people have any questions about any of that. So without further ado, I'll let uh, the good doctor start. So just very briefly, I'm Stephen Mandel. I'm a physician. Uh, I did my uh, graduate work in clinical psychology. I completed all my coursework and all my clinical work that was writing a dissertation. When I had the opportunity to go to medical school, I chose to do anesthesiology, but I continued to be very interested in mood disorders. When it turned out that ketamine was just amazingly effective and safe and fast, for depression, for suicidality, and for PTSD, I really started to pay attention. I paid a lot of interest in the, to the zeros, and as more and more data began to be presented, and I'm very evidence-based, it was all real data, uh, I migrated from anesthesiology to providing ketamine infusions full-time, and I've been doing so since 2014 uh, in my clinic. Uh, for now, almost 4,000 patients, over 13,000 infusions. Uh, it's been extremely safe. I'm not- Recording in progress. I'm not a- Recording stopped. I'm not a person who can run a clinic. My son, who is a, a remarkable guy, here he is, Samuel, is, um, has a background in business and in acting and is very empathic. When he was only 14, he started volunteering at a suicide, suicide uh, crisis hotline for teenagers and devoted himself to that through high school. Uh, he was very involved in lots of uh, service activities, but pursued a career in acting. When I started my clinic, I asked him to co-found it with me because he has the skills that I don't in running a practice. And together we've been doing ketamine infusions full time since uh, since 2014 full time. We've seen a lot of folks. Uh, let's get to right to the slide. What is ketamine? We're gonna, yeah, I'll just really quickly race through this. This is kind of a little uh, preview of what we're gonna try to cover in the time that we have. So the agenda today, what is ketamine? Talk about off-label use, um, the IV infusion uh, protocol for mood disorders, uh, and the treatment results that we're seeing. Some of them, we've actually got a couple uh, patient charts here that are uh, anonymized of uh, some of the PHQ-9 trends. Um, how it works biochemically and psychologically, two kind of distinct mechanisms of action. Um, uh, Dr. McIntyre touched on a little bit of the you know, glutamatergic system and some of those processes. And then there's also some very important experiential uh, components of ketamine and the other psychedelics, uh, the, the um, uh, psychological experience. Talk real quick about side effects, risks, benefits, and results, and then what the future holds. And we'll try to do all that in uh, not enough time. So um, here we go. Ketamine was approved by the FDA in 1970 as an anesthetic. It's a remarkable anesthetic because it's a dissociative anesthetic. It doesn't impair cardiac or respiratory function. It doesn't lower blood pressure. It became the darling of the battlefield crowd for that reason. We were at war at the time in Southeast Asia, and it saved literally thousands of wounded soldiers because in sub-anesthetic doses, it's analgesic, and it enabled them to participate in their own evacuations. It's also used in, uh, in veterinary medicine. That's why a lot of, uh, you know, ask the average person, they say, oh, isn't that a horse tranquilizer or a cat tranquilizer? Well, it is indeed, but it is a human anesthetic FDA approved in 1970, as Dr. Mandel said. And it does also have a, a street use uh, population for um, you know, recreation or others might consider uh, it self-medication. Um, and that's known as special K. So, you know, it's a pretty ubiquitous drug with multiple identities and you ask five different people what it is and they'll each give you a different answer and each of them are correct. It's the most widely used or was the most widely used anesthetic on earth for decades. It's still among the top 10 most widely used anesthetics in the world. The World Health Organization feels it's on their list of top 50 uh, medications that every country should make available to its citizenry. 
And in the last um, 25 years or so, there's been a growing body of research that has shown it to be an incredible uh, elevator of mood and a highly effective treatment in IV infusions of ketamine. And there are other routes of administration. About 90% of the clinical research has been done on IV route of administration of IV infusions of ketamine uh, to be very, very rapid uh, enhancers of mood and eliminating in depression. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Here, there's, there's been no long-term side effects in, in this use of ketamine and short-term uh, short are very, very minimal. Uh, a little dizziness, nausea in about 15% of patients during and following an infusion, feeling tired or fatigued on the day of. Uh, the dissociative experience, which we feel is an important therapeutic component of the treatment, uh, dissipates within 10 to 15 minutes of the uh, infusion being completed and uh, people are pretty much back to themselves hours later after a full night of sleep. So there's no lingering uh, side effects beyond typically 24 hours at most. It's very important to appreciate the difference in route of administration. Uh, almost all the studies have been done with intravenous. As has been pointed out to you uh, by another speaker, intranasal also has some data but it's like 95.5. And intranasal has been shown effective about 45% of the time, 44% of the time. Uh, intravenous is effective 71% of the time. This is in multiple studies. In our clinic, we've tweaked the standard protocol. Uh, we're getting an 83% success rate. That's not one patient or one week or one month. That's over seven years. And we're... Um... Going a little out of order here, but just to add to that, we do use, uh, we're not a research center, we are a treatment center, but we do use um, a lot of assessments and we are very uh, data-driven and evidence-based. So we're using the, um, the BEC-2, PHQ-9, and the MADRIS before, during, and after treatment. We follow patients uh, long-term, uh, even if they completed treatment years ago and haven't been back to the clinic, as long as they're still willing to fill out a bi-weekly PHQ-9 assessment that we text to them through an encrypted and HIPAA-compliant text messaging service. We'll chart that data. They have access to their chart. We have access. We have a number of people who are continuing to uh, respond even you know years after completing their treatment with us. We also send a daily mood question as well. How are you feeling on a scale from one to 10? They can just text back a number, charts it on a separate line graph. If we have time, hopefully we can show you some of those line graphs in some of the following slides. Uh, just one last thing I was gonna add on this. Uh, when we talk about data, as you can see, 137 peer-reviewed studies that have been completed or are underway, proving the efficacy of ketamine for mental health and leading institutions, Yale, Stanford, Harvard, National Institute of Mental Health, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, USC, UCLA. This is way, way, way beyond anecdotal at this point. But I want to emphasize it's a treatment, not a cure. It's not a standalone. All the other things that promote wellness and freedom from cognitive impairment and anhedonia are central to what we're doing. This is not a standalone. Uh, you've just heard uh, another authority talk about CAP. CAP is a very interesting thing. That's ketamine assisted psychotherapy which formally speaking is a simultaneous administration of ketamine and talking therapy. Uh, there's no data that that makes any difference. There's considerable data that talking therapy with ketamine, not simultaneously with, but in conjunction with, facilitates both. So most of the studies we're talking about is gonna be 40 minute long infusions, typically a half a milligram of uh, ketamine per kilogram of body weight over a 40 minute period. They all started out with one single infusion. They said it works great, but it doesn't last. Results were seen for about a week and then uh, depression or other symptoms started to return. And then uh, research started doing a series of infusions and seen a much more pronounced benefit and, and much greater duration. And so now um, in our clinic, we're doing uh, 50, we're providing 55 minute long infusions instead of 40. We're providing it at a slightly higher rate than 0.5. It's more like 0.6 um, uh, milligrams of ketamine per kilogram. And um, over a two to three week period, so that's a series of six. That's one uh, distinction between what we're doing and what the research is doing that's netting better results. And as we mentioned, we are tracking this. Um, the success is typically at 50% or greater uh, reduction of symptoms, and typically lasting about three months. There's huge variability here. Um, 
We have patients who get a great benefit that lasts just a few weeks, and we have uh, a handful who have gone over two years uh, before uh, needing to come back for any additional treatment and everything in between. Go ahead, next slide. So, this uh, operates via the glutamatergic system. It also operates in other ways. It does, in fact, provide, uh, cause brain growth in laboratory models, literally increase in, in dendritic density, increase in receptor density. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of research on this and it's the, the mechanism of effect du jour changes literally monthly and nobody's right and we don't have the answer, or I should say nobody's wrong and nobody has the whole story. If you remember that picture we often see from uh, the Indian subcontinent of five or six or seven blindfolded people feeling an elephant and one says oh it's very pointy because he's feeling the trunk the other say oh it's very hair like because he's feeling the tail the other is feeling the ear and saying it's like an elephant leaf uh, we don't know how ketamine works but the point is it does work it relieves suicidality better than 80 percent of the time it relieves depression it relieves anhedonia. It relieves PTSD. As another speaker pointed out, what happened in your trauma is immutable. It happened. The narrative you carry with you around it is entirely plastic and recreated each time you're triggered. And it's subject, it, particularly with the use of ketamine, it introduces not just neuroplasticity, but plasticity of your memory with good talking therapy and integration you can revise your relationship to your trauma. And we're big advocates of talk therapy. We don't provide it in our clinic. We do have a support group for patients to meet virtually, but um, you know, lifestyle optimization is a big part of any treatment plan and including a ketamine infusion treatment plan. So adequate sleep, uh, nutrition, that's talk therapy, exercise, uh, these things are all gonna net much, much greater relief and longer lasting benefit and are important components um, the psychological experience of the ketamine infusion is also very healing for a lot of people. They can revisit prior traumas or even sometimes uh, visit trauma that's been so deeply um, suppressed that uh, we've had patients say they weren't even aware of it until after their infusion. Uh, it, the ketamine can really quiet the default mode network and the noise in people's minds and allow them to get an objective perspective on themselves, their lives, their trauma things that are going on for them that can be very, very therapeutic. And it's very valuable for them to be able to continue to work through that after their infusion with, uh, with the right support network. So we're uh, very much aligned with uh, Dr. McIntyre's view about CAP and, and psychotherapy during versus after. Um, we see very, very good results for people to be doing psychotherapy after their treatment and in between treatment sessions, not at the same time. There's a lot of self-discovery that's only possible during the infusion when it's a uh, kind of independent experience. The ketamine can give the patient agency. Depressed patients often come feeling uh, that they are hopeless and they feel helpless and they feel worthless. Ketamine makes them the boss of all the bullying voices and judgmental judgments in their heads. Not that they disappear, but they turn down the volume and they make the patient the boss of how attentive they are to them. They'll always be there, but they won't be bullying. Um, really quickly, these are some of the uh, line graphs that I mentioned earlier from our uh, mood monitoring system. Uh, just to quickly explain what we're looking at here, I don't know if you can really read very clearly, uh, probably not, but 42-year-old um, male, the top one here, major depressive disorder, 20 plus years treatment resistant prior to IV infusions with us of ketamine. He had a very quick response and very long lasting relief. I think the chart here at the bottom is uh, back to December of 18 um, into 2019. You can see the dates at the bottom here. He had a, a severe depression score on the PHQ-9. Um, the vertical black lines are uh, initially clumped together on the left side are his initial series. He had six infusions. You can see there over two weeks. He remained uh, taking a PHQ-9 every two weeks and uh, his depression score went from severe to none and was sustained 
from December of 18 all the way through uh, June of 19, where it dipped just a little bit. It didn't even dip out of the, out of the zero uh, depression range, but blue dipped a little. He had a booster infusion, that's one infusion, which brought him back up to a score that looks like at about zero or close to zero, which was then sustained. The one beneath that is 62-year-old female major depressive disorder, bipolar two. Uh, you can see, again, uh, the initial series on the left side of the line graph, severe, um, as she was going through her series, the scores were reduced or her mood climbed, brought her all the way into the green zone of having no depression, which was, again, sustained for many months. I wish we could talk more in more detail with the following um, line graphs, but we are on short time. Uh, we do have them on our website, ketamineclinics.com, and we'd be happy to talk more about them if there's time in a Q&A or, or with any of you individually. Um, and then the last slide here, what the future holds. Depression is endemic or epidemic. It's getting worse. COVID has not helped at all for substance abuse, for child abuse, for partner or spousal abuse. Uh, these things may have been latent in lots of us, but they are really manifesting now. This medicine can help. The increase in productivity and employment and decrease in calling in sick and the amount of binge drinking is enormous. The current methods of addressing depression are not working. We need to stop trying harder and more with the same methods that haven't yielded benefits. We need to try new things for our sake and for the sake of our patients and really for the sake of our society. Yeah, and I'd like to just add that um, for those who may not be aware, and I don't know if we really covered this adequately, you know, you, you might have listened to us and said, wow, well, if it's so wonderful, how come I haven't heard of it or how come it isn't more widespread? Well, the use of ketamine for mood is an off-label use. So ketamine's FDA approved as an anesthetic, but using it for mood is off-label, which I think everyone in the room is familiar with what that means. One in three psychiatric medications are prescribed off-label. Very, very common practice. Ketamine's a generic drug. And so there's no uh, large company advocating for its use, educating doctors, lobbying insurance companies. So they're looking to things like Spravato and to the future of what they can profit from. And ketamine is not profitable in and of itself as a drug. If you run a practice providing it, of course, there's an opportunity there to service your patients well and have a little money left over at the end. But the drug itself is, is a cheap uh, generic drug. And so there's no real big advocate for it and for its use. And so we have, you know, Spravato or Esketamine and other things coming that are um, not always as um, uh, effective really, or that have a, a side effects profile that's less favorable. And uh, this is, you know, something that you can look into more on your own. I know we're very much out of time, but um, it's, it's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so yeah, much. A couple of questions, so, if we could. Please. So, ketamine is preferred over any serotonin inhibitors, uh, SSRI medications, because it works better. It works for. It works much faster. Much faster. It works in a higher percentage of people. Okay. And it has much fewer side effects. Right, but it is a hallucinogenic, right? So, what is the chance of addiction? The chance of addiction is virtually nil. It's not like other substances. I would say the chance of addiction is in the, in the range of ice cream or chocolate. Okay. Yeah, ketamine, ketamine is not physically addictive like opioids, alcohol, nicotine. There's no physical addiction. While some people use it recreationally or they might self-medicate with it on the street, that's more right. a mental escape than anything. And you could do that with, with really anything, right? I mean, video games even, you know, I think could, you could argue are as or more addictive. So, um, well, yes. Yeah. In the back. Thank you. I'm familiar with a case where a patient really did not respond to any other medications, um, no electrical stimulation, and he was an excellent candidate for ketamine. And he was on ketamine for a long time, and he felt much better. The problem was he changed from night to day, from depression to highly active, and he experienced this inhibition. And that um, led him to getting involved in a sexual harassment lawsuit. So my question for you is, have you experienced or seen any disinhibition in those patients who've received ketamine? I have not, and I don't want to generalize from one case. Uh, ketamine 
is an amazing medicine for the depressed. And it's an amazing medicine for the bipolar. Type two as, and type one. It's not a good medicine for a hypomanic people who are starting to amp up anyway. It needs to be given judiciously. It's a very powerful medicine. Powerful medicines given injudiciously and promiscuously can lead to disasters. Uh, and I'm sorry to hear what you're relating to me. When your patients are starting to get real speedy and starting to not only think about things but starting to act on some of their thoughts, you need to be backing off on your ketamine or any other disinhibiting yes, substances. Yes, sir. Now, I think the uh, five ketamine injection protocol with the psychiatrist while the experience was really beautiful and enjoyable uh, I had uh, there were some you know uh, emotional kind of uh, you know I expressed myself uh, some things came up and stuff like that I got zero anti-depression uh, results from it I mean nothing sure and, and another psychiatrist is, is doing uh, the spray with me which I know is much less effective any suggestions? Yeah, I think we should to chat perhaps uh, off screen and off the air. It sounds like this is a very personal concern and it's best if we address it personally. Sure. Yeah, but I just had one cl uh, clarifying question. When you said injections, were they intramuscular injections or did you actually have IV infusions? IV. Okay. Yeah, we can talk after. I know we're over time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Um, I have been glad the opportunity.